and we're live. It is a kind of sleepy day here in the neighborhood. And in Thailand, you may be able to hear the ocean in the background. Rainy season seems to have started, so hopefully uh, it doesn't affect the reception here. Um, today's episode is on a new lens of inquiry. I am not that I'm moving away from the Jungian stuff, but a couple, I guess a month ago when I was in South Africa, I met this cool group of people. Someone uh, lent me a book called Prometheus Rising by Robert Anton Wilson. And uh, in the same way, they around this time last year, Carl Jung's work really like grabbed me by the shirt collar and I became very obsessed with it for pretty much the last 12 months. Uh, this book did the same thing. And um, I've actually been familiar with Robert Anton Wilson for a long time. He's a brilliant thinker. He was kind of a fringe, you know, he was also a science fiction writer, so kind of, but he also wrote a lot of uh, nonfiction books like this one that today's episode is largely based on. Uh, I became familiar with him like 12 years ago when uh, my self development journey was more in like the dating skills world and this before YouTube and the, in the era of uh, lots of ebooks and free videos and all that that stuff like the birth of the online dating forums and a lot of people would pass around information that they thought would, was useful and I've downloaded this torrent of all these different audio files um, that some guy just put together said like oh this is like great for your mindset and it had think and grow rich in there it had a bunch of uh, like how to win friends and influence people as a man thinketh a lot of like uh, training your mind and training your confidence type books and there was a bunch of interviews by this guy, Robert Anton Wilson. I started listening to them and they're all about these weird things. He was referencing neuro-linguistic programming. He was talking about uh, kind of far out stuff that was beyond me at the time. I had yet to try psychedelics. So a lot of what he was talking about was totally not relatable. But it was a name that like stuck in my head. And then I found, I was given this book in South Africa a month ago, started reading it. It totally like immediately changed my perception. But then if you, if you follow, podcast you follow my life i had to rush back to uh, thailand because of covid and um so i only read the first couple chapters but just the first couple chapters totally ch like it added a layer of awareness in my social interactions we're gonna explain why in this episode and uh it's been one of these things that i, I feel like this is my new like uh, area of thought that i want to explore um so Robert Anton Wilson, uh, like I mentioned, he's a brilliant thinker, sci science fiction author, but a lot of his books like, were directly trying to demonstrate aspects of consciousness through fiction. Um, this book is a nonfiction book. Prometheus Rising is uh, basically going through Timothy Leary's eight circuit model of consciousness. Timothy Leary, if you don't know who he is, was a Harvard professor who um, spearheaded the use of LSD in consciousness and very much tied into the counterculture of the 60s and, and he was uh, friends with uh, Richard Alpert who became Ram Dass and um, it's this is basically his model but Robert Anton Wilson wrote this book kind of flushing it out and here I am flushing out Robert Anton Wilson's book on the eight circuit model. Uh, today we're going to go through the first four circuits which are four of the eight circuits which everyone has. The, the later The later four circuits is something that according to both Leary and Wilson most people haven't developed. In fact, even through the four circuits, most people live on the first and second circuit. And wh why this was so, I mean, other than just being interesting ideas and, and very practical in how we uh, relate with the world, um, his model of this eight circuit model very much uh, follows the hero's journey, but in a less uh, mythological lens, more in a neuro neurological lens. So I thought that was interesting because a lot of the stuff we've sp spoken about in previous episodes the mother complex and slaying Medusa, that's a uh, crossing of the threshold in the hero's journey. And then the father wound, secondary father meeting the mentor pretty much corresponds to the first two circuits. And we're going to continue. But instead of looking at things from a mythological lens, we're going to look at things from a neurophysiological lens. Um, all right. Before we jump in, announcements. I have some great podcast guests coming up. If you didn't catch um, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, I think it came out almost two weeks ago now. One of my favorite episodes of the year. Uh, definitely check that out. Um, but we have coming up Carolyn Elliott, who um, runs Witch Magazine, um, and she wrote the book Existential Kink. Uh, we also have Mark Lewis, PhD, uh, who wrote The Biology of Desire. I'm speaking to both of them this week, so those episodes will probably be out in the next two weeks. 
Also speaking with John Gray from Men of From Mars, Women Are From Venus, which um, is an old book. Uh, it was also lent to me recently, uh, and I thought it would totally be dated because I remember watching John Gray on Oprah when I was like five or seven years old, like my mom was watching it. Um, but it's, it's actually a really great book uh, that he uses different language than I use, but very well encapsulates um, masculine and feminine behavior. Um, we also have Montauk Chia, who's been a mentor or a teacher of mine for a long time. Uh, he's going to be on the podcast, I think, in three weeks or so. So that's what's coming up. Uh, also, the contemplativeman.com. It's a free set of exercises that I put together for people who want to focus their attention during quarantine. Uh, it's totally free if you go to contemplativeman.com. It does promote my archetype class, just to be upfront. Um, but I think it's a cool little uh, set of exercises as well. That's a contemplativeman.com. And if you're not in the Mask and Underground group on Facebook, you can uh, join if you want to be part of these discussions and watch the episodes live. And if you are not watching live and you listen to the podcast, as most of you guys do, whether on iTunes or Spotify or directly on my website, uh, I would love if you dropped a review. I'd appreciate that a lot. Um, I've not been historically good at marketing, uh, so I appreciate everyone who has f found the podcast, enjoys the podcast, and if you could take a few seconds to help bump it up, that would be awesome. All right, so jumping in, um, the what uh, from a high level, what I th find so interesting, especially about these first four circuits and the eighth circuit Timothy Leary model, is that uh, just like Eric Neumann's thesis, which we've been uh, speaking about in the for previous episodes on how um, the evolution of consciousness in human humanity maps to the evolution of consciousness in an individual human from infancy to adulthood. Uh, this fits in very well with that. And you can actually see a lot of uh, politics. I mean, I'm most familiar with American politics, but I think this is true of left, right politics everywhere. You can actually see how even political ideas, which seem like these intellectual abstractions, directly relate to these very primal circuits. So we'll start with the first one. It is uh, termed by Robert Anton Wilson as the oral biosurvival circuit. Oral being, it corresponds with Freud's oral stage. If you're familiar with uh, Freud, well, if you're not, I'm going to explain. Uh, the first stage is uh, our infancy stage. So this uh, developed in life or evolved in life uh, three to four billion years ago. So obviously it's, it, it's far, it far predates humanity or anything even close to a human. Um, because this is a neural circuit that even uh, very simple multicellular organisms have. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty much a one-dimensional circuit. You move towards things that give you nourishment and are safe, and you move away th from things that are uh, potentially dangerous. Uh, worms run on this circuit. Pretty much any invertebrate uh, organism, any multicellular organism has some version of this, this circuit. Uh, and you can think of a worm. I know it seems weird to imagine that we have like a worm level uh, circuit in, in our nervous system. But if you think of a worm, uh, not that a worm's reality is necessarily one dimensional, but it only really moves in one dimension uh, towards something behind something. It doesn't really perceive the world uh, too much beyond that. And um, it's actually, you know, it ties into some stuff that relates to the sexuality things that uh, we speak about sometimes. Actually, Montauk Chia, in my last workshop with him, he was speaking about how uh, when it comes to sexual energy cultivation, um, if you've ever practiced any of his stuff or if you practice my stuff on arousalcontrolsecrets.com, uh, there's a lot of um, focus on clenching PC muscles. And, and even Montauk Shia takes it to the next level where when you're doing certain sexual practices, he, he recommends clenching your mouth, clenching your eyes, uh, clenching your sphincters. Why? Because all of the ring muscles in our body through our digestive tract and in other areas of our body all develop together. And I, this is a really old episode, um, but I had an educational kinesiologist on uh, a long time ago uh, speaking about some of the similar things. And she pointed out how um, children, if you see little children cutting paper, very often they will open and close their hand with opening and closing their mouth. It seems silly, like why is a kid opening and closing uh, her mouth while she's cutting paper? But all of this open and close, even though hands aren't necessarily ring muscles, all of this open and close stuff. Uh, all develops together in utero, which is why for a little child, they might have trouble separating opening their mouth and opening their hands. Um, this goes back all the way to uh, three or four billion years ago, our very pre-human, uh, I guess you could call them ancestors. Um, in humans, this uh, 
relates to our mother imprint. So if you remember, we spoke about uh, maternal consciousness um, in the Slaying Medusa episode. Um, and in human behavior, a lot of this comes, uh, relates to our attachment to mother. So uh, for a human baby, this oral biosurvival circuit, its primary drive is to get nourishment from mommy's breasts, right? Uh, seeking nourishment, I mean, that's why it's oral. Like the, the main focus of an infant is to not die as best or, and, and be attached to mom. Uh, so uh, this, this circuitry in us are, are drawn to round things, bosom-like things, warm and womb-like things. This is our infant consciousness. So if you remember from the mother complex episode, um, we spoke about how grown men with mother complexes are basically operating a little too much on this circuit. Like they, uh, they basically lack self-sustenance because they're still attached to mommy. They might be a grown man. They might have cut the um, umbilical cord 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, but emotionally, they're still attached to mom. And you can see this in adult male behavior or adult behavior of any, any gender um, where they, a person lacks uh, self-sustenance. They're, they're still dependent on some sort of authority figure, whether it's their literal parents or society or they have this unhealthy attachment to their employer. They expect something bigger than them to take care of themselves. They have issues with being decisive. Um, these are all traits of someone who's a little bit stuck in... Um, in the oral bio survival circuit. Uh, David says this, that book changed my life. I'm glad I, I'm, I'm actually, I, I wish I read it a long time ago, but great book. Uh, and what's up, Dave? I haven't seen you in a while. Um, hope you're well. Uh, so this first circuit, uh, as far as behavior goes, it's one, it's one dimensional. It's move towards things that provide pleasure, comfort, nourishment, um, and move away from things that cause pain, timidity, and basically the flea response. So if you think of an infant or you think of a worm, I know it's weird to compare those two, but they both run on the circuit. Uh, an infant or a worm has no ability to fight, right? Like if they go into stress mode, they can only flee and an infant can barely flee, right? I, I mean, but that's, that's as far as um, someone on this level of consciousness or proto-consciousness can operate. Um, and the thing is like, if you look at neuroses on the, this first circuit level, uh, they are, all encompassing in the sense that when something when you're in this level of consciousness if something seems wrong it's like everything in the world is wrong and you can think of like this basic child development um, if a child if an infant in particular is not getting a need met um, it doesn't it doesn't have the ability to sense like oh this is why like oh my parent is stressed and you know it's like if an infant's not getting a need met it must there must be something wrong with it there must be something wrong with everything like and uh, neuroses of this the first circuit are all encompassing in that they just seem to be experienced all over the body, all over existence, such as anxiety. It's not localized to anything. As we evolve, we get to be like, okay, here's the problem. We get to we get the ability to compartmentalize issues and see where there's good and bad. But on the infant level, on the first circuit, it's just like everything's either good or everything's either bad. And you could probably think from like social situations, or maybe if you're willing to introspect your own um, your own behavior, if you've ever behaved erratically in a situation, overreacted, something on this bio survival circuit might have gotten triggered. It might not have been rational, you know, like something happening at a party might not have actually threatened your survival, but it might have felt that way. And then you had this like this experience of like, oh, my God, everything in the world is wrong. Or I think a lot of people, especially younger people who grew up with social media, get triggered. Their, their first circuit gets triggered by social media. I mean, we hear all the time about um, kids being cyber bullied who then kill themselves from an adult rational perspective. You're like, okay, some kids made fun of you. Like, why was it that big a deal? But from the first circuit, it's like, oh, I'm getting cut off from uh, my group. I'm going to be ostracized and, and uh, not have any more nourishment from the metaphoric breast. I might as well be dead. Like that's the feeling that a lot of kids have growing up with social media. Uh, so all of this is unconscious, autonomic, and in, um, runs involuntary processes. Um, and again, like, so like, as I mentioned, the safety, it's all, all about seeking safety. Initially, uh, it ties to mommy, uh, as it should when you're an infant. As we evolve, it becomes attached to the tribe, which is why social ostracization is so terrifying. If you're cut off from this authority, this, this bigger entity that takes care of you, in uh, pre-agricultural times, it could mean the death of you. And um, nowadays, uh, this is uh, Robert Anton Wilson's thesis, but I agree. And 
um, other thinkers have thought this, that it has been shifted from the tribe to money. This is, we live in a consumerist society. Um, Wilson calls money bio survival tickets in quotes, like we're all so attached to money because money is the representation of our survival. If something threatens our ability to access cash, uh, most of us assume, are we going to like, oh my God, I'm not going to survive. I'm going to die. It feels that way. And he pointed out how, I think they did this um, like observational or they, they looked back at the interest rates, I think from 1800 to 1900 um, compared to the suicide rates and the interest rates, like the bank interest rates went up and down in lock with the suicide rates. The obvious conclusion being that as interest rates go goes up, more people go out of business, they lose their livelihood. And just like a, uh, a tween who grows up in social media wants to kill themselves when they're being ostracized, a business owner who has no access to money anymore wants to kill himself because like, he immediately feels like, oh, life is over, right? Um, so this is all first circuit stuff. So Wilson speaks about um, how this affects the physical body. And this is one of the pieces in the book where at first I was, I was reading it and I was like, this, I mean, this sounds a little too mystical. Like you're saying like, oh, someone's behaviors will affect the shape of their body. Obviously so many things affect their bodies, but um, there's different ways to look at it. I mean, he was saying how someone who's most heavily imprinted by this first circuit will grow a viscerotonic, meaning their, their body is round, their body is soft. And uh, at first I was like, like, how does, like, what are you talking about? That sounds like a mystical concept. But if you, if you look at it um, just like through cause and effect, if you are most heavily imprinted by your infant circuit, you're still in that mode and that infant circuit drives most of your behavior. You can imagine someone is not gonna be that um, motivated to exercise. Uh, they're not gonna uh, be that motivated to get strong. Um, they might, they, they're very driven by oxytocin, the cuddle hormone and serotonin. So they're probably gonna do a lot more, um, you know, not to be judgmental, but more lazy behaviors uh, because that's what an infant does. Like infant doesn't have any, there's no reason for an infant to have impulses to do anything strenuous. So they might grow up softer. And um, it's interesting about the serotonin a bit. I, uh, I used to follow Charles Polikin's stuff. Uh, he was the Olympic strength coach for the US wrestling team. And he was and a very famous strength coach. He passed away a few years ago. Um, but uh, one of his ideas that I really liked was that he compared um, neurotransmitters to um, the five elements in Chinese medicine. So you said there's five neurotransmitters that drive um, an athlete's behavior. He's speaking about from a strength training perspective. Uh, dopamine is like the fire element. Acetylcholine is wood. Uh, GABA is metal. Um, serotonin is water. And then earth is a balance of the five. And there's um, a personality test uh, by a Dr. Braverman in New York called the Braverman. If you go to the BravermanTest.com, you can just take it. It's, a, it's, a, it's a basically a questionnaire that estimates, based on your answers, what neurotransmitters drive your behavior. Anyway, Polikin um, would use this test with athletes to determine how they should train. So like a dopamine driven person, it needs a lot of intensity and needs to mix it up a lot because they just want like more intensity all the time. An acetylcholine driven person um, needs more complex behaviors because they uh, like to like learn, they like to strategize and learn complex movement patterns. Uh, a GABA person can do the same thing over and over again because they're like super zen. And then he was saying, I never meet a serotonin person because they don't play sports. Serotonin people are the water element. They end up doing yoga or they don't end up doing physical activity. And he said it obviously in a judgmental way. But this this is completely in line with the whole uh, viscerotonic idea of if you are primarily driven by this infantile circuit, this infant circuit, yeah, I mean, you're probably not going to uh, stress your body out. You're probably, I mean, there's the emotional expectation that someone else will take care of your problems for you, as is how an infant thinks. Um, so your body would grow up soft and um, and in, in uh, Wilhelm Reich's terms, your body would be unarmored. Um, even in response to stress, an infant doesn't ever like armor or try to fight. Like it doesn't have a fight response. It only has flea and barely has flea. So um, your body is basically soft when you're in this mode. Not to say this is bad, even though it's an infant circuit, it's an important circuit for all of us uh, because we all need oxytocin and serotonin. And um, uh, as we know, uh, an infant, if it's not cuddled, if it's not touched, it will die. Uh, and if a child that's not cuddled and touched will grow up more sickly than others. Like you need that oxytocin and serotonin uh, to be healthy. So people who are lacking in this first circuit exercise because maybe due to shame or due to a lack of a parent's love, um, 
they just don't exercise this this neural circuit or it atrophies. They end up growing very stiff in the body, uh, very their body might dry out. They might have respiratory issues because this first circuit um, regulates our breathing. So the most simple pranayama meditations that have us focus on our breathing and chill out and breathe is stimulating this first circuit of coming back into a state of ease that babies are in. Um, many yoga teachers, meditation teachers, when they teach belly breathing and easy breathing will reference, oh, look at how an infant breathes. An infant breathes with absolutely no tension. This is, the, this is activating that first circuit. Um, so yeah, I mean, anyone who's uptight, uh, people who are stiff, people who are rigid, people who uh, they actually dry out, they are lacking exercise in this first circuit. And uh, it's important to understand with all of these circuits, especially the first four, they each, um, they each evolve as a reaction to each other. This first circuit, we all have it, and it's related to our bio survivability. And um, in later in, in uh, Prometheus Rising, he speaks about brainwashing, which is one of the reasons why I was drawn to this. Actually, an aside, I'm not sure about this. Um, I would have to verify this, but I believe Robert Anton Wilson was close with Richard Bandler, who invented neuro-linguistic programming, which is an application of hypnosis that can be used for brainwashing. It became popular in the pickup community as a way to manipulate people. It's popular in sales and Tony Robbins is a NLP expert. Also my cult leader, uh, if you if you didn't catch the, my two episodes on being in a matriarchal cult, you can check them out. But my cult leader um, was also an expert in NLP. So I don't know if uh, she, I, I'm pretty sure she's read this book, but um, anyway, this book says, uh, if you want to create a new imprint, you must reduce someone down to the first circuit. So for, or reduce yourself. So like if you're trying to rebuild yourself, a lot of what we spoke about when it comes to the hero's journey is bringing yourself back into the unconscious where you're a more formless person, where your ego is not as hard and rebuilding yourself in a person that you want to be. This is saying physiologically, if you want to change your personality, for, hopefully for the better, you want to go from being timid to healing your childhood wounds and becoming confident. Or if you have devilish intentions, if you want to brainwash people or, or maybe brainwash people for the good. I mean, most religions developed and uh, religious ritual developed to essentially brainwash people into being happier, more confident people. Obviously, that has been uh used for negative purposes or, or uh, not uh, wholesome purposes by religions and cults and advertising and governments and whatnot. That's what propaganda is. But to effectively change someone's reality, you don't try to convince them on the, the human rational level. You try to convince them. You try to bring them back down to the infant level and then build them back up with whatever rea reality you desire. Same thing for developing yourself. So that's good to know. And also, this is again why pranayama and meditation focuses on the breathing. It activates that first circuit. And if you have some unconscious behavior that you don't want, say that you um, are timid in social situations, bring yourself back down to this circuit. Uh, and at that point, you can uh, consciously rebuild yourself. The second circuit uh, builds off of that it is the toddler circuit. It is the anal emotional territorial circuit, anal being Freud's uh, term. Uh, the first circuit is uh, corresponds with Freud's id. The second circuit uh, corresponds with Freud's ego. This is where we start to develop our concept of self. A toddler learns to stand upright. A toddler learns to say no. A toddler learns to control his excrement. So he actually can control uh, his muscles. He develops voluntary control of his muscles. This neural circuit developed in life 500 million to 1 billion years ago. So obviously still far predating humans or even proto-humans. And it exists in the thalamus, which is part of the limbic system, uh, which in humans is in our emotional center. Um, so yeah, as I said, uh, learn to say no. And, and uh, this anal stuff, I mean, you can look at it a bit ter uh, metaphorically, but animals mark their territory with excrement. Many, many animals, many mammals uh, mark their territory with excrement. This is, this is also uh, where a human defines his territory. A toddler starts to recognize, oh, this is mine, that is yours, like this is this is my space. An infant doesn't have that sense. And um, this part of us maps to our father imprinting, our, our paternal side of the psyche. And in these first two circuits, you can see 
most left right politics. Um, Robert Anton Wilson makes this little chart within the book um, of matrist or matriarchal and patrist or patriarchal societies. Uh, and we could also completely map this to the uh, masculine feminine side of the psyche. Basically, circuit one is the feminine side of the maternal side. Circuit one is what dominates in a matriarchal society. In a matriarchal society, sexuality tends to be free. Uh, in a patriarchal society, which runs on circuit two, uh, sexuality tends to be controlled. And we'll explain why that is. In a matriarchal society, it tends to be egalitarian and a flat power structure. In a patriarchal society, there's a lot of power structure. Um, politically, uh, matriarchal societies tend to be progressive or matriarchal or um, for circuit one um, imperatives tend to be uh, more progressive and liberal, uh, whereas the second circuit uh, stuff tends to be more conservative. Um, socially, uh, matriarchal society is more hedonic. Uh, they're more into pleasure. I mean, and this directly you can see in the in the first circuit, it's all about receiving pleasure and nourishment and receiving love. Um, so they're more hedonic, whereas the second circuit is like, I don't need you, mom and dad. I don't need you, society. I don't need you, sugar, uh, pleasure, anything. So it's more ascetic. And spiritual paths that are of the more patriarchal second circuit nature tend to be more stoic and ascetic of like, we don't need the pleasures of life. We're going to meditate under a tree for two days or something. Sexual dimorphism in a matriarchal society is low, uh, whereas sexual dimorphism in a patriarchal society or second circuit society is um, heightened. And all of this stuff, you can basically see it's like an infant versus toddler. We all have these circuits in us, right? Uh, this is the infant circuit and the toddler circuit. And it's interesting to look at it um, from a, a sociological perspective. In any society, I'm, I'm most familiar with um, American politics because I'm American, but uh, the left and right is very much an infant or infant imperatives versus toddler imperatives. So um, you can look at one issue that's big in America, the Second Amendment, uh, gun control, um, the infant side, or I should say the, the left side, which is running more on a on a first circuit idea is like, we should have no guns, no guns. There's no reason to have guns. There's no reason that I have any ability to do violence. If we get rid of guns, uh, violence will go away or, or like uh, or the government should deal with it for us. They'll protect us. I mean, Many people think this way. I think it's a bit of an extreme and naive si uh, way to think on one end, but it's like coming from an infant level of perception of uh, just like, let's not deal with it. Someone else will take care of it for, uh, for us. No one needs a gun. The extreme right also has a naive uh, extreme idea of like, uh, we all need guns. Everybody needs guns. There should be no gun control. Everyone should have guns because there's bad stuff out in the world. And for all armed, uh, then we can all take care of ourselves. Also a very naive way. I mean, all of these issues uh, have good points on both sides. I mean, the reason why they haven't been resolved is that uh, there's not a clear resolution. Um, and there's many reasons for that, but it's basically infant ideology versus toddler ideology. And in most of politics can be seen that way. The, the gun control issue is a particularly um, survival level issue. So even though maybe not on a rational level, but when it comes to like how it triggers people's emotions, it's on that level of for like infant toddler um, perceptions. And it's and I also brought up the the arm the arm the, the right to bear arms issue because uh, it uh, ties directly into the language Wilhelm Reich used to describe these first two circuits of being unarmored as an in infant, where like your your body is completely soft, your your brain is completely plastic. Um, whereas as a toddler, you learn to harden up, you learn to develop tension, you learn to resist or fight things, whether emotionally or sometimes physically. And this is uh, the second circuit is where the ego develops. So um, this is a line I took from the book. The ego is the mammalian recognition of one's status in the pack. Uh, every pack animal has a second circuit. You can see this in dogs. Um, it's a little more conscious than, you know, the infant level, obviously. Dogs are more conscious than worms, um, certainly, but it's not, it's not at the level of human consciousness yet. And one example that um, Wilson brings up is that dogs can understand emotional content pretty well and understand simple words, sit, stay, come here, good boy. Um, to talk to a dog in complex sentences is ridiculous. The dog is not gonna know what you're talking about. But as far as emotional content and emotional intent, dogs and toddlers are just about as developed as any human. I mean, we are, our emotional side of the brain doesn't, doesn't evolve much further than that. So 
Um, but what it does evolve is another um, dimension of perception. So that first circuit you remember was one dimensional. Uh, the worm or the infant uh, can only move towards things that are comforting and nourishing and move away from things that are scary. Uh, we still have that, but the second circuit adds a, another axis. So if you imagine another dimension, so if you imagine um, a horizontal axis of uh, friendly to hostile, that's the first circuit. Um, you can add another axis, the horizontal axis of dominance and submission. When we're toddlers or um, as life evolved into mammals, we started to recognize uh, who is superior to us and who is inferior, who can we control and who can control us. Very important for pack animals because we need to know our status in the pack. I mean, uh, part of what has allowed mammals to do more things or survive beyond other life forms is that uh, they can work together and, and be social. But in order to be social and operate as a superorganism, you have to know who's top dog. If we're all top dog, um, it's not, we're not going to function well as a pack. So if you imagine these two dimensions, this horizontal uh, retreat or um, friendly hostile and this uh, vertical dominant submission, you have four quadrants. And um, we all can operate in all four quadrants, but most people tend to operate in one or the other, um, depending on how we were raised and maybe genetic factors. There's the dominant friendly person uh, who is like the good loving parents. There's the dominant hostile person who's like the terrible parent or the, the tyrant. There's the uh, friendly submissive person who is like the dependent, the follower. And then there's the um, hostile submissive person who is like the paranoid person or the person who's always complaining or critical of whoever the authority is, but they don't take the lead themselves. And um, this is as far as I read in the book when I was in South Africa before I came um, to Thailand. So for a while, um, I was viewing everything through this lens. I only read up to the first two circuits. So of course, that's how I was seeing the world and every social group situation I was in, I was like categorizing people. Are they friendly or are they hostile? Are they dominant or are they submissive? And, you know, obviously uh, when you have a certain idea in your head, you see the world that way. But I did find it's a useful and interesting way to organize people because or recognize how people are operating because you can pretty much um, extrapolate a lot of people's behaviors or understand a lot of people's behaviors from this lens in the group. Obviously the dominant submissive um, idea depends on other people, right? Like it's all on a continuum. No one's just one or the other. And, um, but in, in pol this is basically the root of politics. All politics fits in, this, in these four quadrants. And Wilson gives this idea of if you put um, one of these four people on an island together, the way the dynamics would play out is that the dominant friendly and the hostile friendly would obviously compete for power. But the dominant friendly person, even though they're dominant, they're also friendly and they just want things to be okay within the group. They'll eventually be like, okay, they'll cede power to the dominant hostile person because the dominant hostile person, the hostility is not evil, right? The hostility comes from fear. It's that first circuit of like, oh, it's not safe for me to be uh, open here. So I have to retreat or I have to like distrust or be hostile. So the hostile person only feels safe when they are in charge, the hostile dominant person. So they will not rest and be easy until they are put in charge. So the friendly dominant person will cede control eventually to the hostile dominant person. The friendly submissive person doesn't care who's in charge, but they want someone to be in charge. They are anxious until someone tells them what to do or someone takes the lead. So once the, the two dominant people agree that the hostile dominant will be in charge, the friendly submissive person is like, okay, I'm happy. I will listen to whoever you say is in charge. The um, submissive hostile person is a pain in everyone's ass no matter what. They will complain no matter what because they don't trust anyone. That's the hostility, but they also don't have the dominance to take the lead. Typically, people who develop their second circuit because they're developing this uh, um, desire and ability and perception of power politics, they tend to lean towards uh, dominance, right? Like if you have a very highly developed um, neurocircuitry for recognizing power, you're probably going to do things that develop power or play politics, or you might develop Machiavellianism in yourself. Um, so it's very rare that a person would develop a lot of um, awareness of politics and then not be political themselves. So you can see someone who is highly um, developed in this uh, will grow up uh, what's called musculotonic. Um, there, if you take the idea that 
in the first circuit, you're in infant mode. You're um, developing, you're, you're growing up soft because you don't want to do work. Someone who's very much in the um, second circuit will be more prone to thinking, or I need to be tough. I need to be hard. They might um, emphasize physical labor. They might emphasize being strong. They might they'll grow up more athletically. And again, if you look at the uh, look at politics again, um, most of conservative politics, which runs on the se second circuit, is basically on this idea that the world is doggy dog, um, hard out there. Everyone needs to be tough. Um, so you have to be strong. That's why we all need to be armed. We all need to, you know. And um, I was speaking about this with a friend yesterday about how um, she grew up in the South, and um, and I think it's in, it's. It's in one of the Malcolm Gladwell's books. I think it's in Outliers or Blink. They did this study about um, hostility, and they were trying to do this study at some university um, about whether or not positive feedback or negative feedback makes you more um, uh, aggressive or not. So they had a bunch of people take a test, an aptitude test. Half the people they said, um, oh, "You're you're slightly dumb. You're dumb." Half the people they said, "Oh, you're really smart." It's totally random, though. After the study, um, they had them have to walk down a hallway and they had um, an experimenter come in and basically play chicken with them. And they wanted to see if um, the positive feedback or negative feedback made the person move out of the way or bump the person. Turned out that the positive feedback, negative feedback had nothing to do with whether or not the person was aggressive with the person playing chicken. Basically, there's only enough room for one person to pass. So either they would yield or they would bump the person. The one factor that made a difference was whether or not that person grew up in the American South. Because the American South, this is Malcolm Gladwell's idea, I think there's more nuances to this, but he was saying that the American South has uh, a culture of honor um, because the American South was, uh, their culture was developed by um, descendants of people who grew up in the Scottish Highlands, where if you're a shepherd, you have to be hard because if you're not violent, someone could steal your entire livelihood and steal your, your sheep. Right. Um, it's different from agrarian societies where no one can just steal all of your wheat. They would have to pluck all of that wheat, but they can just steal all of your sheep. So shepherds have to be violent. They have to have a reputation of violence, which is why in the South, um, there's a line that no, a, no Southern jury has ever convicted a man for killing someone who insulted his wife. Right. That's just part of American Southern culture that you take care of your own business. If someone threatens your territory, you kill them. And um, my friend who grew up in the South said, uh, if you ever step on someone's property in the South, they'll pull a gun on you. That's just normal behavior. Conservative politics, again, has this assumption that it's a dog eat dog world out there. You have to be hard. And this, again, is a toddler mentality. And this, I'm not trying to be judgmental of people on, on the left or the right, but it is a toddler circuit of like, we need to defend our territory. It's a, it's, um, a pre human mammalian circuit of like dogs have this, right? Like, we don't know who you are, but we're going to bark because we have to defend our territory. And this is where political thinking comes in, Machiavellianism comes in. The whole idea behind um, Mach Machiavelli's The Prince and like all of his power politics and the 48 Laws of Power is the idea that it's a doggy dark world and if you don't play power politics, people are going to take advantage of you. Um, so yes, people who are highly developed on the second circuit tend to be more conservative, more stoic, and their bodies may grow up more musculotonic because they emphasize strength uh, more than the, the first circuit people who emphasize softness. And uh, before I go into the cir third circuit, if you look at like, I mean, this, this directly relates to a lot of the archetypal stuff we spoke about in the Medusa um, episode and the father wound episode. All of this stuff is infant and toddler development, um, mother and father stuff. This is all very primal. And a lot of our neuroses come from that. So when we spoke about the father wound, which is um, a Joseph Campbell, Jungian idea where a child, it could be a man or a woman, loses respect for his father because, you know, no one's father is perfect, right? We, we, instead of seeing our father as the almighty protector God, we can see, oh, he's got an insecurity here. He's got these, uh, you know, moral flaws, these character flaws, and we lose faith. That's when we develop this idea, positively or negatively, that we need to fend for ourselves and defend ourselves. So in a healthy way, if it, if it does happen in a secure way, if your father was flawed, but can still provide for you in a secure way. You might think, oh, dad isn't perfect, but I need to, I need to learn how to defend myself. I need to learn how to be my own man. Um, the way it often comes out is that we see our father fail when we're still in, in a, a very soft toddler mode and we're like, oh shit, dad can't protect me. The world isn't safe. 
and then it creates insecurity. I think for many men, this creates insecurities in our masculinity. I mean, all of us have, all men have some insecurity in our masculinity, unless you had a really perfect upbringing and really perfect father and all the conditions of your um, developmental life were perfect, which I don't, I don't know if that's true for anybody. Um, but but our, as I spoke about in the father wound um, episode, whatever your securities are in your masculinity are, whatever they happen to be, whether it's in communication or leadership or dating or sexuality or whatever, it very likely maps to something around your father, if, if only negligence or absence for, from your father. I, I spoke to a guy, I speak to a lot of people with this idea, but very recently I spoke to a guy who, um, uh, he seemed to have a lot of issues wrapped up with his mom, but they were also kind of like, they were male insecurities that came from the fact that his dad just didn't do anything. His dad wasn't a bad guy, but his mom wore the pants, his mom called all the shots, and his dad was kind of this sheepish dude. And a lot of men who have fathers who never never had a backbone grow up with an insecurity. They might become hyper aggressive, or they might just have this feeling that the world isn't safe because dad didn't protect me emotionally, so I need to be hostile. And they end up either as a hostile dominant person who's a tyrannical and a bully to other people or a hostile submissive paranoid person who just doesn't trust anything anyway most of our neuroses come from those first two circuits uh raul com commented uh, i think that's powerful i think he was referring to the father wound um yeah this is all in our neurology it all goes back to primal mammalian stuff so now the we're going to the third circuit the third circuit uh, is in the cortex. It's, it's developed about 100,000 years ago um, with our, some of our human ancestors, uh, maybe pre-homo sapiens, but homo something ancestors. Uh, they had some, some idea of what we refer to as our mind. Um, and this third circuit is referred to as the time-bending semantic circuit. Uh, I'm going to refer, I'm going to explain what the time-bending part is first. I think it's the more simple idea to understand. I mean, our perception of time uh, is kind of a myth mystical concept, but also a uh, psychological concept. Our perception of time is relative. If you've ever done, um, if you've ever noticed how your dream time is very different than your waking time, if you've ever done psychedelics, you notice that time passes very differently. A lot of our perception of time is created by our mind, and it's created specifically by this third circuit. Um, time for an infant or a toddler, time for a worm, or for uh, a dog is very different than a, for an adult human. For someone on the first circuit, for a worm or for an infant, there isn't really time. Like everything is now. There's only, you're being here now when you're activating that first circuit. Let's say you're, you're on drugs or you've meditated in a way or you've done yoga or Kundalini or something where like you've really activated your first circuit, maybe through pranayama breathing, where you're very much here, you're being here now, as Ram Dass says, you've taken a lot of LSD, that first circuit is really active. There is no time. Everything is now, anything that's not now doesn't exist. Everything is now. Um, the second circuit, we develop some perception of time. Dogs have some perception of time. If a dog doesn't have a need met, it, it can recognize that a dog, I mean, the Example that Wilson brings up is that when a dog meets another dog, they need to like, kind of suss out who is the top dog based on emitting of fear hormones or or not fear hormones. And like that, they have some concept of time. They have a concept of relative time, but a dog doesn't have an idea of what a year is or a calendar, obviously. Neither does a toddler, but a toddler can notice when something takes a long time or not a long time. Um, Circuit three is where we can now conceive of time. After being a toddler, we can recognize birthdays and the year and, and all that stuff. Hu uh, adult humans can map out a calendar. They can map out the world, which relates to the semantic circuit, which is semantic words, uh, because as I mentioned in a lot of the brainwashing episodes and the, and the cult episodes, language creates reality. Uh, language is how we map things and you can look at how um, for anyone who I don't I only, I only speak English fluently but I'm learning other languages I can order food in a few other languages and it, it's really interesting to see how uh, different languages phrase things differently and use different syntaxes and people who speak those languages view the world differently like um, speaking of time actually um, almost all cultures nowadays 
view time as like you're moving forward in time and the past is behind you. Uh, excuse me, I need to get the hiccups. There are some cultures, uh, I think indigenous cultures in South America, which view time differently. Uh, they view you're, you're going back in time and they view that your past is in front of you because you can see it and you're stepping backwards in time as time progresses. Completely arbitrary distinction. Why do we view ourselves moving forward in time? It's because our language has us that way. Um, a buddy of mine who speaks a bunch of languages uh, said one of the reasons why Americans are fat is that uh, when we eat, we, we say we only stop eating when we say we're full. So in our subconscious, it's like we need to keep eating and eating and eating until we cannot eat anymore till we're full because that's our language for we're done. Whereas in German, um, he said that the, 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 verb, the word for saying you're done eating is I'm satisfied. So Germans only eat till they're satisfied. Or German speakers eat till they're satisfied. English speakers eat till they're full. Um, obviously, there's fat Germans and skinny Americans and, all, and skinny English speakers and all that stuff. But there's a, a spider on my screen. Um, uh, but we can see how language creates reality. And, uh, and as I spoke about extensively in my cult episodes, the, the language we use, even language we're using metaphorically or figuratively, or, or even facetiously, eventually will be how we view the world. And, and just case in point with myself, I started using language uh, from Prometheus Rising about the first two circuits in my head. And I started noticing, oh, all these power politics and this person is dominant, friendly, and this person is hostile, whatever. Um, how the labels we put on things is what makes them real. And you can see this a lot in, um, I guess, more advanced politics about how people fight over um, identity and words and the pronoun thing. All of this is third circuit stuff because for someone operating on the third circuit, labels matter so much because labels determine reality. And, and we can see how, um, <clears throat> well, before we get into that, before we get into the political stuff, we use our verbiage, we use these maps and symbology, as we spoke about a lot in the Jungian stuff, to understand and filter reality. Because reality, when we can perceive everything through our five senses, there is so much going on. And there's so much meaning that can be drawn. It's unlimited meaning that can be drawn from anything that we need to have a framework to filter reality so we can make sense of what's going on. So when it comes to physical objects, we don't have to really question it. No matter what language you speak or your perceptions of the world, we can agree that this is a cup, whatever you call it. It's, it's, it's yellow, it's whatever. But when it comes to something that's a little more abstract, like um, authority or something like... Um, patriotism or fatherhood. I mean, I can't say things of the same. This is what's on my mind, I guess. Uh, all of these things are abstract and we can perceive them as positive or negative uh, depending on how we put it. Um, you can call someone um, a really heartfelt person or you can call them a bleeding heart liberal. Same thing, but one is a positive spin on it. One's a negative spin because things have denotations, which are literal meanings, and then have connotations, which is the emotional context we attach to it. So when you think about most things that people argue about politically, we're talking about semantical distinctions, basically changing the connotation for the same physical thing. And um, I want to give a little shout out to uh, friend Patrick, who put me onto Owen Barfield's work. Uh, Owen Barfield's uh, another think thinker from the previous century. Um, and he speaks a lot about metaphor and semantics. And he pointed out how every word in every language has some root in something physical or something you can do with something physical. So everything is a, a, an object, has a root in an object or an action verb. Um, obviously, we have many words that have nothing to do with physical things. But if you go through the etymological roots of things, they all relate to something physical or something you can do with something physical. Why? Because before our semantic circuit highly developed and our language became uh, sophisticated, our ancestors, their original perceptions of the world of like, oh, what should we call this thing? Or what should we do with this thing? Those were what words were. And eventually, as the semantic circuit developed, we um, added symbology and added meaning and metaphor. And what originally was just a cup became a vessel, became uh, something that can hold things. And you can, you can come up with many words. You think of the most abstract word anti-establishmentarianism, the roots of those words have something to do with physical things. I don't know what it is, but I'd imagine establishment maybe has something to do with a structure, all that stuff, right? And most of our metaphors come from that. Most of our expressions come from things uh, uh, that uh, were once physical. Um, 
The reason why we had to develop this circuit, in the same way that the second circuit developed to get people, get, um, get mammals or birds or other life forms with the second circuit to, do, to be able to organize as a pack, school of fish or whatever, they can survive better as a, not just a multicellular organism, but a group of multicellular organisms. Um, and that was why the second circuit developed to develop socializing and, and um, dominance hierarchies so that all the lobsters can work together on some level, all the humans can work together, all the wolves can work together to take down their prey. Um, humans needed to take it to the next level. And this is something that Yuval Noah Harari speaks about in uh, the first chapter of Sapiens, the reasons why what allowed humans and Homo sapiens specifically to dominate the earth was that we created mythology. All the other humans, um, the other uh, Homo, Homo erectus, the Neanderthals, all these other pre-Homo sapiens humans, because they were humans as well, Homo meaning human, uh, they were not able to compete with Homo sapiens, even though Neanderthals were way stronger uh, than us. Homo erectus had other advantages, physiological advantages over humans, uh, maybe even social advantages over humans, or over sa Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens developed this third circuit, developed a cortex where they can create meaning from things and create mythology. So we've spoken a lot about mythology from a Jungian perspective on how this hero's journey is deep within our psyche. It relates to collective unconscious, it relates to the um, journey that our ego wants to take to develop itself. Mythology has a very uh, uh, strong sociological function of binding us. So. Um, because our social brain, our second circuit, can only um, perceive up, or can only handle up to 150 relationships. This is known as Dunbar's number. Beyond 150 relationships, we just can't keep track of all the people. So what we do as humans is that we need to, um, if we want to organize beyond 150 people, beyond Dunbar's number, beyond a small tribe or small pack, we need to have a mythology that connects all of us. So religion is one example. Um, a Muslim guy from Canada and a Muslim guy from the Middle East maybe have never met each other, maybe have no friends in common, but they can meet up in some place in the world. And because they're both, let's say they both practice Islam, they both have the same ideology, they can relate to each other and trust each other and have a common language of understanding and work together on something, right? Maybe they pray together. Um, same thing with two Americans. Uh, uh, American uh, America is another mythology, right? It's an agreement that we've made enough people in the world over at least a billion people in the world agree that America is a thing. It's a, an idea that we've all agreed on. It's in the collective consensus. So an American uh, from one end of the country, an American from another end of the country can meet up in France and they can relate because they're both Americans. They have that common culture. And we spoke about this in the father wound episode on how the father, the paternal side of the psyche uh, or the, that the masculine consciousness is what creates culture. Uh, this is this is culture, right? This is part of the, the the third circuit of rationalization of developing a culture, which is somewhat arbitrary meanings, but arbitrary meanings that bind people, so that uh, a giant corporation like Apple, which has, which has way more people than 150 people, can all work together synergistically. Uh, 300 or 400 million Americans can do things in synergy, whether it's simply pay taxes or vote. Um, and you can pick you can pick anything. Any group of people over 150 can work together. Because we have this third circuit, the semantic circuit, that allows us to connect on over ideas, over symbolism, whether it's behind a flag or a religious symbol. Cults obviously do this. Um, and I spoke about this again, the semantics in my cults uh, by slowly modifying our language. And even for someone like me who was pretty aware of the language I was using, because I was starting to use the cult verbiage, I started to perceive the world from the cult lens. And before I knew it, I was seeing the world exactly the way everyone else was seeing it because I started to use their words. Even though I knew that the words they were using were, were brainwashy terms or were memes meant to solidify a certain kind of culture. One difference about the third circuit compared to the first two circuits is that the first two circuits are more what we call animal circuits. I mean, the third circuit we, we view as the human circuit because this, we're the only animals that have highly developed semantical circuits. We're the only animals with uh, highly complex language. I mean, that's arguable. I mean, dolphins have something going on, whales too. But um, the first two circuits, which all mammals have, uh, our first two circuits are identical, almost identical in dogs. Um, 
they are homeostatic. Uh, they run on negative feedback. This means that they're pretty much trying to bring us back to a state of homeostasis where we are status quo normal and safe. So the first circuit um, has to do with survival and life. Anything that threatens life is trying to use that negative feedback to bring us back. If something is not longer feeling safe and warm and nourishing, we'll move away from that so we can get back to a state where we're safe and, and warm and nourished. Um, the second circuit, similarly, instead of survival, it's viewing status. So anything that threatens status uh, is going to try to like, oh, something's threatening our status. We're going to try to bring ourselves back. Someone's threatening our territory. We're going to fight that invader to bring us back to a state of whatever our status is, whatever our, our idea that this is what should be normal in terms of survival and in terms of status. So if you look at social mechanisms that do this, religion often controls people through this threat of survival, whether it's uh, you're going to be damned to hell if you don't accept the salvation of this group. That's a first circuit thing. People will get like, oh my God, my, my survival beyond the afterlife, my survival in this life is going to be threatened. I'm going to buy into this ideology uh, or, or any allegiance to anything. Actually, I'm going to get into, I'm going to get into semantical twistings in a second. But um, on the second level, uh, things like patriotism and product advertising runs on the second circuit a lot. Um, Russell Brunson, who's the founder of ClickFunnels, he's an internet marketer uh, who I've learned a lot from. He speaks about this a lot in that uh, actually one of the things I didn't like about his stuff and a lot of internet marketers is that they are, are constantly trying to trigger pain points and anxieties in people. Usually when it comes to status and Russell Brunson and many internet marketers will speak about this directly that when you're pitching a product, you want to threaten people's statuses. Uh, I have a lot of stuff around marketing and stuff, so I'm not going to get too deep into that, but that's something that all effective advertising does, whether it's a can of Coke or it's um, a car or a, a, a class or a, a type of education. Um, a lot of times it's, it's uh, triggering someone's uh, fear around their status or, or offering them a, a boost in status, and that's why the person buys the the ab machine or they buy the new type of supplement like, oh, it's going to somehow subconsciously increase my status. Status is good. Second circuit thing. Now you might be thinking, oh, I don't buy stuff based on these primitive circuitry. N not directly, um, but any salesperson knows that all sales is emotional. What we do though is rationalize our emotional decision afterwards. Any salesperson will tell you this. We do this by taking the emotional response from the first two circuits and our third circuit adds rationality on top. So since our rationality runs our life and determines our uh, how we perceive reality, most of us think we're always operating from rationality and most of us uh, overvalue our rationality thinking, oh, rationality is the way to deal with things. That's true when it comes to certain types of problems, intellectual problems, but when it comes to ideology uh, or a lot of emotional decisions, what we're really doing is rationalizing anything. And the thing is that the thing about the semantic circuit and the thing about um, not uh, abstract things um, is that you can twist things anyway. Like I was saying, uh, we can all agree that this is a cup. No one is going to disagree that this is a cup and it weighs a certain amount and it looks a certain way. But when it comes to authority, what is authority? Uh, is authority good or bad? Uh, or is this racial group good or bad? Or is this idea or this thing a human right or not all these things become abstractions and you can argue uh, either way so to avoid uh two ideological things that might be tied too much to people's emotions i'll speak about nutrition because i think you know the way people argue about veganism versus the carnivore diet or veganism versus paleo if you ever if you ever are so unfortunate to look at the the comments or the back and forth arguments between a, a vegan and a non-vegan or a vegan and a paleo person online. Please don't do that, but you might want to do it just for education unless you, oh, anyway. Uh, people get so heated. And sometimes I'm like, man, like, why do you give a shit if someone else is vegan? Why do you give a shit if someone else is not vegan? Like, just live your life. Why is this such a big deal? Um, and then, you know, and both sides will bring up, you take any debate like this, both sides will have really good argument arguments, both sides will have um, a really good data supporting their arguments because this is the circuit threes like, like, oh, I have data. Well, I have data. And like you can throw it back and forth because almost any point can be rationalized by the, the third circuit, the semantic uh, brain, which is our left cortex. Um, as, as noted in cults and advertising and politics, you can twist anything for the connotations you want it to have. 
Um, but everything is driven by our first two circuits where our emotions come from. So the reason why people get so heated about differences in nutrition, uh, differences in religious ideology, differences in political ideology, um, is that it's threatening their first two circuits, their, their survival, their perception of survival, their perception of status. A lot of people, when they're debating things politically, will say they'll actually use moral justifications or they'll say, oh, this is dangerous. Like, this is a very, this is threatening to our democracy. This is a very dangerous way to think for our children. All of that might be true, but you can say that on every, uh, on many arguments. If you look at nutrition, for instance, one of the reasons why uh, someone fighting for the carnivore diet will be so emotional about it is that if you, is that, is that they are buying into a reality that gives them security on maybe a status level, maybe they want to look a certain way and like be healthy and uh, be strong, but also a survival level if they, they want to live a long time or they, they, like food is where they're getting their nourishment from. Um, same thing from religion, but I'll, st I'll stay away from religion to stick with nutrition. Um, if you bring up evidence that there is a reality that is different than their reality, there's, a, there's evidence that is not good to eat vegan and they eat vegan, you're now threatening their entire perception of everything, right? Um, if, they're, if they're feeding their children a certain way under the hope that they're going to have healthy children and now you're bringing up evidence that it's not, now they're worried. So the only way that they can justify you existing is to attack you. The third circuit rationality, if you're really operating from that level, you, you can see things holistically and you don't care what other people do. Okay, that person eats this way, this person eats this way, this person believes in this God, I believe in this God, who cares? But um, but really, we only very few of us operate from the third circuit. We operate from the first two circuits and then use the third circuit to justify why we're so angry that you believe things that are different than us, why we're so angry that you have this idea on tax reform or it should be this way or this idea when it comes to how we should eat or this idea of what the nature of the universe is. All of this emotional anger really comes from the second circuit. And the reason why the second circuit is activated is that very often we're afraid of our survival on some level, which is why people will fight over things that are not real. People will go to war and kill each other over what shape the guy in the sky is or, or something like that. It's totally crazy from a rational level, but it's something that people use the third circuit to justify. Anyway, uh, we talked about how language creates reality. Uh, the third circuit uh, creates culture. Another difference between, oh, I was saying, so the first two circuits are homeostatic. They try to bring uh, you back to a, a stable level of survival and um, status. The third circuit, because it operates on, on abstractions, the, cir the third circuit is all about ideas and is not tied to the earth. Um, the third circuit can be ever expanding. So the first two circuits always bring you back to a medium. The third circuit grows and grows and grows. And if you ever if you've ever been, I don't know, let's say you smoked a lot of weed and you're thinking really hard and you're thinking about thinking, you're thinking about the things, thoughts you're thinking, you're thinking about the thoughts you think. I mean, it could go crazy. You can, you can spiral out of control forever. Um, uh, so the third circuit is where people can float off into the world. Um, and actually, I mean, I'll call myself out because like, I know I speak way too fast in these videos and I, I do try to, um, I do try to slow down, but even speaking at this speed, it feels very uncomfortable because I'm operating from my third circuit right now. I'm speaking about ab abstract ideas and I just want to go, 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 because the third circuit doesn't, um, doesn't recognize three-dimensional space. It just wants to go ideas, ideas, ideas. Uh, the internet, uh, the electronic world is all a third circuit thing. It's all things we can perceive with our cortex, but has no registry in three-dimensional space, um, which is one of the dangers of getting sucked up into your phone is that Unlike doing things in the physical world where you have to pass through space and you have to recognize the progression of time, there is no space in your phone. There is no space when you're scrolling Reddit or going through and click to click to click. When you're clicking on the links in Wikipedia uh, forever, uh, you're not actually traveling in physical space. So your, 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 your mind doesn't register the passing of time, which is why four hours can pass and you've just been looking up links on Wikipedia or Reddit or pornography or YouTube or whatever. Or, or any social medium. Um, anyway, I was talking, speaking about the ungrounded, calling myself out for speaking too fast. Uh, it goes back to a, an idea that I got from um, an improv coach. Uh, was that he was comparing the way athletes speak versus academics. And when an athlete speaks, even though I mean it's a it's a stereotype, but you know as we can say, athletes are probably not as articulate as mo most athletes are not as articulate 
as most academics, they might not use this, a wide range of vocabulary. But if you ever see a press conference with an athlete, they very rarely say, um, and, uh, and, and like have long gaps. They're just like, yeah, I knocked him out in the second round. Yeah, I, I knew he was nervous. I hit him to the body or like, you know, I, I hit that home run in the fourth inning because I knew, you know, they'll, they speak very directly because they're speaking about concrete events. They were perceiving things from a second circuit where things are just what they are. Like there's no reason to go um and ah uh and like question because this cup is a cup. Whereas uh, an academic or someone speaking about abstractions the way I'm speaking right now, and I know I'm saying um and ah uh, and I'm speaking oh, maybe I'm going to slow down, but uh, it's easy to get ungrounded when you're speaking about abstractions because um, ideas, these abstractions don't take place in, in the ground. Like this third circuit I'm talking about is an idea that we're talking about. Yes, there is something physical, but we're not actually observing the mechanisms in the brain. They're just ideas in our head that we're uh, correlating to behaviors we've observed or, or concepts, right? So it's very easy to get ungrounded when you're speaking about concepts. And um, that's why like a lot of people will fall asleep when reading dense material or listening to a lecture that's ta all talking about abstractions um, because it's like so taxing on our cortex to use so much energy to pay attention to a very abstract thing that we get sleepy, which is why going back to the marketers, copywriters, internet marketers, advertisers will all say, if you're talking about a concept, you have to ground it back in a story. You have to tell stories that people can feel and imagine characters doing things because that makes it more real and easy to, uh, to think about. Um, yes. So, According to Robert Anton Wilson, a genius is someone who can take these very high level ideas and translate it into third, third dimensional speech. Um, oh, and all right. So the thing about, again, the third circuit being able to spiral out of control creates culture. The third circuit also creates negative entropy or, or neg entropy, uh, which is the organization of random data, or at random things, right? Entropy, um, the second law of thermodynamics in the physical world, entropy is ever increasing. Things are becoming more and more random. Systems are becoming more and more dead. Uh, whereas when we organize something, we're, we're giving it um, meaning, we're uh, having it, uh, we're giving a specific uh, organization that we call information. We're reducing entropy, we're adding order, we're increasing the aliveness of a system, we're increasing complexity. And according to Wilson, this is the, the real source of wealth. Wealth comes from ideas, simple idea, creativity, right? Third circuit stuff. And um, this reminds, I mean, on a spiritual level, this reminds me of a line from my favorite uh, novel, Shantaram. Great book about that has a lot of masculinity themes and consciousness themes, but the main character's mentor um, is speaking about his definition of God. And he's saying that he's talking about the Big Bang and how the Big Bang is, you know, set off this uh, movement of matter and energy in the universe and is constantly developing into more and more complexity. Some matter organized into life, life organized into multicellular organisms, into humans into computers, you know, stuff we're talking about here. And this movement towards infinite complexity is what God is. From a more human perspective, you can think of singularity, the idea that we're going to merge with uh, the non-physical, with uh, the electronic world, for instance, um, uh, is another idea towards this is the third semantic circuit going to infinite complexity where all of reality is purely ideas and we're no longer directly tied to material world this is basically um, the uh, plot of the movie the matrix where robots farm our bodies and our reality now is the simulation that the robots have created to entertain us while they farm our bodies for energy um so to end off the first circuit uh, uh sorry the third circuit someone who is primarily driven on the third circuit, they don't value physical things so much. So their body, according to Wilson, they will develop um, into a cerebrotonic body, a head focused body. Their energy goes up to their brain more than their body. They probably don't eat a lot. So they might be skinny. They probably uh, don't exercise a lot because they don't really care about the physical world. They're all about the world of ideas. So they might be an egghead, right? You can take this metaphorically or literally. What's interesting about uh, Robert Anton Wilson's views of these first three circuits and how they affect the body is that they line up uh, directly with the doshas from um, Ayurveda. Uh, the first circuit would be kapha, uh, fullness. 
Uh, the second circuit would be Pitta, where a body grows up strong and hard. And the third circuit would be Vada, where everything is skinny and more focused on thoughts and airy things. Um, yes, infinite complexity, movement away from matter. Um, talk about the athlete versus the academic. I'll throw one more idea. Um, like not, not that I know much about singularity uh, beyond science fiction ideas or stuff that we've all blogged, but um, I interviewed a friend, Dave Burns, who's a coach. He used, to, he used to go by the business monk. I don't know if he goes by that anymore. And we did a really interesting podcast that he asked me not to release yet because he's writing a book on the mythology of money. And um, he shared some ideas that are in his book that he didn't want to come out until his book comes out. So I, don't, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this one little idea, which is he's talking about the mythology of money on how money and value is this concept, uh, kind of in line with uh, Harari's view and Sapiens is that we create a mythology around money and then money materialized into coins, gold, pot-bellied pigs, and then it's slowly becoming more and more immaterial. It's returning back to its immaterial self. Uh, money became uh, paper money, which was a um, an idea backed by gold, then it became backed by promises. And if you look at cryptocurrency or how most money exists as numbers in a computer, um, money has gone from material slowly into more immaterial as our, our semantic circuit has created the world to be more and more immaterial. Most of us uh, spend most of our attention and our existence on screens where our attention and the way we're perceiving things is not existing in the material world. It's existing in this immaterial world, uh, typically the internet. So this is the semantic circuit kind of going out of control uh, because unlike the first two circuits, it does not regulate itself. Which is why it brings us to the last circuit we're going to speak about today. Circuit four, um, which was developed to control the upward infinite progress of the third circuit. Had the fourth circuit not developed, we'd probably all be living in the internet right now. Um, the third circuit came to control progress. Um, as we mentioned, every circuit develops as a reaction to the previous circuit. So the second circuit evolved to protect the softness of the first circuit. The third circuit um, evolved to organize people beyond the social ability of the second circuit and also rationalize things and map out and plan in regards to time. The fourth circuit is the moral socio-sexual circuit, which developed about 30,000 years ago. Um, the prominence of Homo sapiens, us, it's... Uh, it corresponds with the left neo neocortex of the human brain. And uh, this is where morality was developed to curb things that we, like, so the, the third circuit can think about anything. It can imagine any configuration, any permutation of matter and things. And uh, this, the, the fourth circuit added morality to control this and, and give us order and organization mm -hmm. because even though a, a human society can now, I, um, connect over a mythology, no one says that we should connect over one mythology. People can, con if, if, uh, if every individual let their third circuit just develop freely, we'd all probably come up with a totally different view of reality and not, um, not, not like, there's no reason why we should all agree on the same mythology. The fourth circuit uh, introduced morality and says, if you don't do such and such, you are wrong, essentially. It's, the fourth circuit is the gift of shame. Um, so it, a lot of it relates to uh, sexuality because even our most uh, primitive ancestors, I mean, not our most primitive ancestors, but our, our much more primitive ancestors who didn't quite understand how babies are made, didn't quite understand like what are the factors that allow your child to look like you or um, sexuality to be a certain way. It knew that there was something to sexuality and the organization of society. And we talked about this in the mother complex and father wound episodes about why patriarchy has evolved and why it was kind of inevitable based on um, masculine parts of the consciousness trying to be like, oh, we need to control all the uh, dangerous factors in the world. It's kind of an extension of the second circuit, but now on a moral level of like, oh, we need to control sexuality, that's dangerous. Oh, sexuality seems to be controlled by women, let's control women, uh, creativity, uh, creates randomness. We need to control that. So a lot of this was controlling uh, ever progressive forces, which eventually you know became oppression. But I, I would postulate that it wasn't started with hatred or anything. It was it was done out of fear of like we need to control things going on. 
Um, so he brought up how uh, Robert Anton Wilson brought up how there are no universal taboos in cultures other than there must be something that controls sexuality. There is no culture, no human culture in history that didn't have some sort of sexual taboos or something that was forbidden versus okay. And um, the, the one universal taboo, he says, is that sexuality must be regulated by the society. Now, what that regulation is, is kind of arbitrary, maybe kind of arbitrarily decided by this, the Third Circuit, but uh, strictly enforced by the Fourth Circuit. And uh, the example he brings up is that if, a, if the president of the United States married his sister, that would not be okay. He would lose his job, people would kick him out, people would demonize him like, how could you marry your sister? That's gross, that's unethical, that's evil. Uh, so he can't do that. But uh, in ancient Egypt, the pharaoh had to marry his sister. If he didn't marry his sister, his people would be like, that's wrong, you're evil, we're gonna take you out of power, like, you have to marry your sister, that's wrong. Who's right? Uh, obviously, from our perspective, we think we're right, like you shouldn't marry a sister, incense is bad, but uh, it is kind of an arbitrary taboo created um, uh, by different cultures. And the only common thing is everyone, every culture has a rule over whether or not it's okay to marry your sister, for example. Uh, our, uh, he says like, our ancestors knew that sexual selection matters, so there had to be some control. No one really knew what the control should be, and, and I would argue as a person of modern times, we do know a lot more now on how sexuality works, and we know that it's probably not a good idea genetically to marry your sister because you're risking, uh, you're risking uh, recessive genes coming out in your children, inbreeding, all that stuff. Um, but this is this, uh, going back way back to biblical times, for instance. This is why you can see some of the uh, taboos and rules that ancient religions have. For instance, um, you're only Jewish if your mother's Jewish. Why? Because back in the day, or really in any day, you can never 100% be sure, before genetic testing, you can never be 100% uh, sure who your father is, but you know who your mother is because you came out of her body. So uh, for the early uh, promoters of Judaism who wanted to ensure that a child uh, who was called Jewish actually came from a Jewish parent, uh, they said it has to go through your mother because we never really know who a, f a person's father is people were coveting each other's wives and all that stuff all the time. So that's why they created that rule. If you look at other rules, Islam has a lot of controls around sexuality, of course. Uh, Christian, I mean, all the religion, I mean, the major religions, particularly the most patriarchal religions, the big three, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, have the most controls around sexuality and they have the most, uh, the most use of the, the, this fourth circuit, this moral socio-sexual circuit. But after sexuality, all of our social taboos and our social norms uh, build off of it. Uh, how is it okay to behave in society um, when it comes to work kind of relates to mating selection. Because like all of these taboos or all of these social and moral controls initially developed to control the relationship between attraction and mating and between mating and reproduction. So the latter can be like birth control or infanticide uh, are, are ways that we control the relationship between sex and actually making babies. Uh, and then the, the former, the, the, the relationship between attraction and who you have sex with also controlled. Like throughout history, every culture has said, it's okay to sleep with this type of person and not this type of person. In the first world, we've kind of laxed on that. Uh, pansexuality is more okay. But even 50 years ago, in parts of first world countries, if you uh, dated someone outside of your race, you'd be ostracized or attacked or stoned to death or something like that. Um, so that's why the fourth control, the, the fourth circuit um, developed, um, and this is uh, the so-called uh, parent circuit uh, because it's where you no longer just care about yourself. Uh, this fourth circuit developed in humans. One argument of why it developed is because you now care about your child's life. You not only care about just making sure your child is nourished and um, and of a decent status. You also care about how your your child uh, operates in society because that's also a reflection on you. And also your child's ability to survive and have status depends on their social interactions, which is why um, a parent who's highly um, running on the fourth circuit or a person highly running on the first circuit might become very involved in their child's life where they have a lot of like rules of like, you need to you know go to sleep at this time, you can only dress this way, 
I don't want you to look at people this way. I don't want you to date. Like they have a lot of rules around their children uh, because their fourth circuit is is very active. Um, and one thing, you know, regarding the infinite possibilities of third circuit where you can, and actually going even back down to the infant level, an infant's brain is totally plastic. Um, it can learn any language. It can be any type of person. For the most part, it can have any type of status in society. It can play any role, whether it's a gender role or political role or status role. It can, it can almost do anything. The fourth circuit uh, is a way of collapsing the infinite possibility into something specific. Same thing with the semantic circuit. You can think about anything. You can follow any ideology. The fourth circuit collapses you into the ideology of your culture, of your, of your reference group. This might seem like a bad thing. In many ways, it's oppressed a lot of people. It's oppressed them individuality, whether it's on a sexual level or creative level or a self-expression level. However, there is a function to this. Um, the whole idea behind the parent thing and we spoke about this in the father wound episode again. Um, a lot of men who are like in Peter Pan mode where they don't want to grow up, they still, or I mean, not just men. This is true for a lot of millennials, I'd say, young people, people who have grew up with cons consumerism and the internet. Um, as I mentioned in other episodes, consumerism has us grow up later. Like it's, you know, in the 50s, you were expected to be an adult when you graduated high school in the... Uh, in pre-biblical times, you were expected to be an adult when you went through puberty. You were able to have a family. You should be able to, to handle your own shit. Part of it because people died younger, but also just like our bodies have us be adults at a certain age. As consumerism has become more popular or uh, become the norm, uh, and we're at a consumerist peak right now, um, we're, we're growing up later and later because the idea behind consumerism is that the longer you stay as a child in child psychology, the more you need to buy things to feel complete. Another idea behind consumerism is that if, if you have enough money, you can buy all your needs and you don't need people and you don't need anything. You don't need relationships. Obviously, this is not true because of our earlier circuits, but that's an idea behind consumerism. And um, uh, I think this is a really bad thing uh, for many people because you see people, I, I'd say, of my generation and younger, millennials and younger the most, but you see this throughout generations as well people who don't want to grow up because they're still in this idea that, oh, I can be anything I can do. I could be anything when I grow up. I'm like, dude, you're 35 years old. You've already grown up. Pick a fucking career. Pick something. You can't, I mean, it's nice to be in the realm of infinite possibility when you're 13. But when you're 30, you better have picked a path because if you're in the realm of infinite possibility, then you've never actually collapsed the wave function and, and done anything real and material. You're still in the realm of like, oh, I can do anything, meaning you've done nothing. Um, so one line from the book is survival and status means sacrificing the infinite possibilities of the unconscious. Humans can be anything, uh, which is great, but you kind of have to pick something. And um, this relates a lot to the Jungian stuff we're talking about. The whole idea behind the hero's journey is that you are stuck on your culture. You're, you're um, a slave to your moral, socio-sexual survival circuit that you're parents or your society has imprinted on you. That's, that's the status quo in the hero's journey. And then for some reason, you, you get this wake up call, a call to adventure, Trinity knocks on your door, a rabbit leads you down a hole or something. And you have this feeling of, oh, I need to go on an adventure. And you do a bunch of stuff. You have some adventures in the movies. They go, the hero goes and does stuff. Um, but really it's an unconscious, it's a, a journey that brings us into our unconscious, into the collective unconscious, back into this realm of infinite possibilities so that we can rebuild ourselves in a way that's more intentional and more empowered than whatever our society or parents or reference group imposed on us. That's the whole point of the hero's journey and why most of us are drawn to hero's journeys in, in films and stuff. Um, so that's why we have, uh, that's why we have to collapse the wave function, but hopefully we collapse it in a way that we become who we want to be rather than uh, becoming what society just tells us to be. So just to recap all the four circuits here, and I think that, so make sure, I... oh yeah, well I have a few more things to say on the fourth circuit, but in Freudian terms, the first circuit is the oral stage. The second circuit is the anal stage or ego. The first circuit is the id. Um, he doesn't reference the third circuit, which according to Wilson is because Freud was such a rationalist. He was such an abstract thinker that to him, thinking rationally was like a fish to water. He didn't re even recognize it as a stage because to him, that was the way, that was just how he viewed the world. 
And the fourth stage was the genital stage. And one of the reasons, and a lot of Jungians make fun of Freudians for being so focused on sex. One possibility for this is that if Freud operated from a third circuit almost entirely, the fourth circuit seems so fascinating to him because it was the next level of development according from his perspective. From Jungian perspective, the first circuit is sensation, pleasure, pain. The second circuit is dealing with feelings, socializing. Um, the third circuit was rationality. And for some reason, Jung doesn't really focus on the fourth circuit. Um, maybe because, Wilson doesn't say this, but maybe because uh, Jung was a moralist or maybe because he just was trying not to focus on sex the way that Freud did. We don't know. In the triune brain theory, the first circuit is reptilian nervous system. The second circuit is the limbic system, or mammalian brain. And the third circuit is the human brain. Uh, close off the, the fourth circuit. Um, just some more ideas about it. Uh, the widespread uh, guilt that most of us have, especially most those of us who grew up in fourth circuit patriarchal religions, such as the big three, um, the reason why we, all of us have guilt, everyone has, everyone who grew up Catholic is Catholic guilt, is because the Catholic paradigm of how people should act in the Catholic tribe is impossible to, to live up to. And Wilson says, uh, widespread guilt throughout cultures uh, is because no one can quite perfectly fit the tribal view of whatever um, the norm should be. Whether you're um, a pharaoh in Egypt that's being told you have to marry your sister or a president in America that says you absolutely cannot marry your sister. There's something, I mean, I don't know why, that, that was the example he used in the book, but um, no one fits the mold 100% off the board. So all of us have on some level, unless we are really fortunate in our upbringing, some level of guilt and shame because unconsciously we're not living up to our reference group's uh, expectations. Uh, this is uh, one, one, another fourth circuit uh, action is that right hand path religions like the ascetic religions, uh, they, all, they all say go celibate. Why? Because if you're celibate, you're fully controlling the dangers that the fourth circuit is afraid of. You're fully controlling sexuality. One thing that's interesting, you know, as, as we mentioned about the body, uh, Wilson says that people on the first circuit, people heavily imprinted on the first circuit grow up soft. People uh, from the second circuit grew up muscular. People on the cir uh, third circuit grew up skinny and eggheaded. Uh, he says people who are most heavily imprinted by the fourth circuit grew up beautiful because of all the cues and controls and awareness of uh, around sexuality that they get from their parents or their upbringing somehow uh, has them develop more neuro sexual neurotransmitters, which has them develop in a way that we perceive to be beauty. Again, you can take it somewhat metaphorically, or I think there's probably some truth to that. Because, um, yeah, I mean, if you're constantly, even if you're like being negatively imprinted around sexuality, like your your parent is constantly saying like, oh, you can't date, uh, stop dressing so subtly, short, uh, make that skirt longer, people are going to look at you, uh, you have to cover yourself from head to toe because men are going to look at you. Uh, if you're getting those signals from a young age, let's say you're a young girl and you're getting those signals from a young age, it makes you more aware of sexuality even on a negative level, and it might have you develop more sexual neurotransmitters. That last bit might be a stretch, but at least this is, is uh, Wilson's rationale. Um, yes, and he also talks about how, again, this is the parent role. When you step into a parent role, literally, you have to give up a lot of, I mean, a lot of parents complain once they have kids, they have to give up certain dreams. That's part of collapsing the wave function. If you're going to devote a lot of energy into raising a child, you can't do everything anymore. You have to kind of, and you also have to pick certain ideologies. Even if it, your ideology is of openness, you have to be like, okay, this is how I'm going to raise my child. You have to pick something on the on this fourth circuit level of this is how sh things should be, or this is the this is the control of 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 behavior that I'm going to choose, whatever that happens to be. And Wilson says one of the reasons why homosexual people um, seem to be more creative, and homosexuals have push the culture a little bit more. Da Vinci was uh, well known to be gay. There's a lot of very creative uh, gay people throughout history. He, uh, Wilson says one of the reasons for that is because uh, gay people don't have children, so they never have to think in those terms of how do I control my impulses. They just keep going and going. Um, so uh, he also talks about the Kabbalah. It's now speaking about all four circuits together. The Kabbalah, which is uh, Jewish mysticism, um, one of their core theses is that, or one of their aims, I should say, is to 
bring the individual into balance in the same way of the universe. So like the micro individual is a microcosm of the universe. So you're trying to balance the four elements within yourself. Uh, these four elements correspond with the four circuits. Um, earth being the first circuit, water being the second circuit, um, air being the third circuit, you know, thinking and the, and, uh, the fourth circuit being fire, sexuality, uh, just a bit of trivia. And you can see on a more grounded level, um, how we, how we are, how our environment treats us through these stages of development, uh, very much leads to our traits on these levels. And if you think of like four major traits, if you look at on the infinite, on the infant, not infinite, infant level, if, uh, when we're in this soft first circuit, uh, setting, depending on how our parents provide secure or insecure safety for us will lead to our development, uh, on the level of anxiety versus confidence. If our parents weren't there from us when, when we were infants and we were terrified, it's likely we'll grow up with that, that, that circuit not being uh, developed in a good way. And we grow up anxious. The second circuit, um, if <clears throat> as a toddler, um, our, our inputs and a toddler nature kind of develop our view of power and dominance or submission. Um, if we had, you know, a lot of has been said about how kids who grew up as bullies, um, had a parent who was particularly oppressive or abused them in some way. So this kid gets this imprint of like, this is how you have to treat people. And maybe to make up for how they're being oppressed at home, they take it out and bully other kids or something like that. Uh, so our, our view of dominant submission, a lot, our hostility also, a lot of that is imprinted during our toddler phase. Our third circuit uh, develops more uh, between toddler and adolescence uh, where um, this is, this is where it's like school mostly gives us that, uh, school gives us our semantical maps, um, how we view reality, um, our culture. There's a lot of brainwashing in school. Uh, not even that to say that's a, a bad thing. Everything is brainwashing to a degree, but, um, school, the way conventional school is done in the West is that conventional schooling developed off of the industrial revolution where the ideal human being was a factory worker at that time. So most of our schooling is, is built around the idea of being a factory worker. The way that school is structured is largely that as we've gone into this more technological age where the, the, the most useful type of human is not a, is a, is not a technological worker. And I'd even argue that, um, with this COVID stuff, we might really be moving towards, uh, I mean, we're certainly moving towards remote work, the remote worker, the digital nomad might actually be. Uh, raised up in the collective consciousness as the ideal type of worker and school already is developing kind of out of necessity towards that. Uh, my cousin's a teacher and, and she was saying how she's teaching her elementary school kids through Zoom calls now. Uh, so this might be the future of the world, kind of like in Wally or many dystopias. Um, but education is developing that way. I mean, other brainwashing in, in schools like the Pledge of Allegiance in the United States, you're basically mouthing this ritual over and over again pledging allegiance, like you're pledging to the mythology, uh, this third circuit idea, which binds us as Americans. Do you grow up willing to go to war on behalf of your country or something like that? That's a, that's a cynical way of looking at it, obviously. Um, but oh, and one thing you're saying, uh, this is where we learn language too. So like, it's very hard for a child to learn how to read after the age of seven. It's very hard for a child to learn language. If he's, if he's never been exposed to language at all, a feral child has a very hard time uh, uh, learning language because the, the brain has a, has, is no longer plastic when it comes to that past toddler age, past seven years old, let's say. So um, feral children, someone who's past seven years old, but for some reason never learned language, essentially has no mind. Like they can't, they, they don't... Uh, they basically are, are stuck at the level of um, a mammal because, or it's like a pack mammal, like a dog or something, because they've, they're uh, no longer plastic enough to learn language and they can never really develop their human consciousness, which I think is interesting. So the first circuit develops anxiety versus confidence. The second circuit develops uh, dominance versus submission. The third circuit from age seven ish to adolescence is where we develop our fluency of ideas versus our dumbness um, or lack of intelligence. <clears throat> Tied to the language, the reason why we call someone who's mute, dumb, or it's probably not politically correct anymore, but we used to, is because language and intelligence are tied together in our semantical maps. So finally, the, uh, the fourth circuit, which develops around puberty when our, our bodies uh, 
turn on the, the sexuality, uh, you know, our bodies develop, we become interested in sex and, and all that stuff, obviously. This is where we get in line with the collective. And this is why, um, again, spoke about this in the father wound episode. Uh, in pre-agricultural societies, the rites of passage were always done around puberty. When uh, a boy is around 12 years old, let's say, um, the, the males of the group abduct him from his mother, take him out into the wilderness, put him through trials and tribulations. And we spoke about then, the, one of the reasons is to teach him to access his metal, his chutzpah, his strength, his internal fortitude, but also attach that to the collective. The purpose of the rites of passage was also to um, uh, humble his hubris. So a pubescent boy has all this testosterone. He feels strong all of a sudden. He feels stronger than his mother. He feels stronger than his sisters. He feels stronger than the non-pubescent boys. Um, the males of the group basically have to slap him into, into line so that he doesn't go around um, using his testosterone impulses to bash people and rape and hurt people. Uh, the males of the tribe humble him so that he gets in line with the tribe. And this is why a lot of our modern rites of passage, bachelor parties, military hazing, fraternity hazing, sports team hazing, they basically do the same thing. In a sports team or in a fraternity, the, the, the hazers might not know why they're doing it. They might, they might think, oh, we're doing it to like increase the guy's confidence, but also create loyalty to the group, both of which are true. They might not realize that they're also um, playing out a very deeply wired unconscious bit of programming that most men in particular have because males tend to be, pubescent males tend to be the most destructive um, and they have to be put in line. This is also where brainwashing comes in. I wanna tell a small story I haven't told before um, <clears throat> uh, for my rugby hazing. Uh, I, I mean, whatever, I mean, I don't think anybody I went to college with gives a shit they tell the story at this point, but I was on the rugby team in college uh, they had something called rookie night and i just want to say like compared to other sports team it wasn't it wasn't like a, an ongoing hazing like it was a club team i wouldn't have put up with that i don't think anybody would have put up with that uh, and i think generally the guys on my rugby team were good dudes um and they didn't have bad intentions but they had this thing called rookie night it was one night where uh not all the rookies because we were a pretty big team but like eight of the rookies who were like the most like in in, in the crowd socially uh, we're invited to the the rugby house late at night. Um, we were told to um, collect a bunch of random objects that seemed humiliating. We had to get a bunch of giant cucumbers and unlubricated condoms and unfiltered cigarettes and like all this weird stuff. It was like kind of a scavenger hunt. It had to be secret. We had to show up to the rugby house uh, at like midnight or something. <clears throat> and they basically put us through a rite of passage, which had a lot of humiliation, a lot of confusion, a lot of them t telling us no matter what we did was wrong. Uh, a lot of drinking to the point of inebriation because getting shit phase drunk brings us back to that first circuit where we can be re-imprinted. And uh, yeah, they did a bunch of stuff where uh, we were humiliated and inebriated and brought to a certain level. And then they built us back up partly by, uh, they, they put us through all these random physical tasks uh, initially, which were impossible and then became a little more possible or, and there was like other ways that we can succeed, but only only if we work together. So it actually was a really great team building exercise. Like um, they would, I'm not even gonna say what they did. It wasn't anything particularly terrible, but they were just humiliating acts of like being tied to a post or like being uh, made into a stilt man. And like in order to get through, the eight of us had to really support each other. So there's a lot of brotherhood uh, bonding. Also, we're all throwing up literally every like few seconds because like there's so much in us. And uh, anyway, I'm not even, there's a lot, a lot of, Brory frat boy stuff, but it, I mean, there was a deep psychological purpose to it. Not to say it was a good purpose, but there was a purpose in that they built us back up. And then as they were building, building back our confidence, as we were sobering up as well, um, they had us learn the team rugby song, which I'm not going to repeat. It was also, it was also supposed to be a secret, but whatever, I'm telling all the story. Um, the song was particularly, uh, gross, kind, I mean, quite misogynistic. It was all about, you know, banging chicks and all that stuff, like stuff that any one of us would have been embarrassed for our female friends to hear or our mothers to hear, or maybe, maybe many of our regular friends to hear. Like, it was like, we had to learn this song and memorize the song. It was like, um, it wasn't like, it wasn't particularly hateful, but it was like, uh, there's a lot of bro humor and then stuff that you wouldn't just say in public, you know, the reason why, uh, I, I mean, unconsciously these things exist, uh, 
And it, actually, the same thing happened. In, a similar thing happens in military hazing when I was in OCS. They didn't do the same things. They didn't get us drunk, but they inebriated us with sleep deprivation. They humiliated us with a bunch of tasks. We had to learn how to work together and support each other and get in line and learn a certain jargon, semantical jargon. Um, they replaced our common language with naval terminology, um, the same way the cult did as well. I mean, all of these things, it's the same exact mechanisms. Back to the rugby story. I had to learn this song that I'd be embarrassed for people to uh, hear me sing because it's a taboo. And uh, it's also what the co I was watching this documentary um, on the Cosa Nostra, the, the Sicilian mafia. And one of their rites of passage was that, and this was in the early 1900s, 1800s, they would have to defile the, a picture of a Catholic saint, which in a Catholic country like Italy, super taboo thing. So, you know, they do a taboo thing. I was, we were doing the college kids version of taboo singing this very misogynistic song, but we're doing it all together, witnessing each, each, each other. So now, because we did a taboo that was, we did a, a, a taboo action, this taboo to the greater society. Now the smaller group is a little more bound. Now we're a little more attached to this small group rugby team reality than we are to the, uh, the, the greater collective. In the Marine Corps, we learn naval terminology. We learn to behave in a certain way so that we're more attached to the Marine Corps than we are to the rest of American society, um, those that would call us killers. We're more attached to the killers, right? Uh, same thing in the cults. We start using all this uh, clitoris choking terminology. I became less attached to the rest of the world. They didn't understand my values anymore. This is the purpose of all this fourth circuit programming. And again, this is how we brainwash people. You bring people down to the first circuit, rebuild them in a certain uh, uh, certain way. <clears throat> Not that I want you to brainwash anyone. It's, it's partly, we got to learn the dark arts to make sure we don't are not susceptible to them. But also, this same process is how a person can develop themselves. This is how someone, simply through pranayama meditation, can bring themselves back down to the first circuit uh, where they don't care about society, they don't care about abstract ideology, they don't care about power dynamics. They come back to this infantile be here now mentality and then they can intentionally rebuild themselves up with the uh, status, with the ideology, with the um, morality that they consciously decide that hopefully is more empowering. The problem is we only know what we know, so we're always limited by our, our human consciousness. Um, last idea on brainwashing uh, is another thing that Russell Brunson says about uh, marketing, copywriting, is if you want to convince people of something, whether to buy your product or to vote for you in the election, you have to speak at a third grade level or lower. And uh, back in 2016, he actually broke down the 2016 American presidency election and said how Trump speaks at like a second grade level. So everyone, everyone who's operating from a first circuit survival fear or second circuit um, uh, status fear can all understand him. And the, the case in point, the whole uh, building a wall to Mexico thing, totally ridiculous idea from a rational perspective. But for someone operating on that second circuit, they're like, yes, we need to build a wall. Like he's threatening like, territory. We got to defend our territory. That's a very primitive idea. Whereas uh, the other candidates uh, spoke at like fifth and eighth grade levels. So for most of the, po the voting population, which operates from these uh, first two uh, primitive circuits, just like a dog or a toddler, they can't think about these abstract ideas. Andrew Yang, I mean, he's got some interesting ideas, the, but most people don't understand what he's talking about. E even if his ideas were, were to work, and I don't know if they would, most people, most of the voting population cannot understand what the hell he's talking about or how he's going to give $1,000 to everyone, whether or not he can. Uh, they will understand build a wall. So um, yeah, you got to push those lower buttons. Uh, okay, and very last, very last idea. Um, and I, I mean, I have two more ideas. Uh, the way we respond to problems can be seen uh, through these four circuits as well, too. If you're faced, and this is like the more personal development side of things, if you're faced with a problem, someone who says, uh, oh, can someone just deal with it for me is operating from a first circuit. They want a parent to deal with it for them, whether it's a political problem or an individual problem. Can someone just handle this for me? Uh, not that it's a bad thing. It's important to be in a receptive state sometimes. I, you know, in, in more of our sexual polarity discussions, we've talked about how this is the gift that a good masculine presence gives a woman where she can go back to the nourishment of the first circuit and like receive someone else's act of service or gift of attention. It's not a bad thing. And all of us need to exercise our playfulness sometimes. And actually, one of the reasons why uh, in the 
sex work industry, the number one client for pro dominatrices are high power CEOs. Why? Because a, a, a high power CEO who's super high in status and he's always running on a second circuit, maybe a third circuit or fourth circuit controlling people, <clears throat> uh, he needs to sometimes exercise his first circuit. Otherwise, he feels like empty inside. We want to come into this balance as, as Kabbalah says, we want to have like the four elements balanced us. These four primitive circuits need to all be exercised. So for a guy who's so on the extreme of controlling people and always being top dog, he needs to uh, hire a dominatrix, which is usually a young, pretty woman who beats him into submission. Why? Because that gets him to return to this nourishing, infantile, bio survival, oral state where he can like exercise uh, the infant circuit in his in his uh, nervous system again. Uh, a second circuit person in response to a problem, the running on this toddler emotional territorial thing will be like, well, I'm going to kill the problem. Something is bothering me. I'm going to kill it. Most conservative politics come from that. Uh, the Second Amendment extreme proponents are all running on second circuit. It's a dog eat dog. It's a dog eat dog world. There's a problem. I got to kill it. That's the second circuit response. The third circuit response is, oh, let's, let's rationalize it. So someone who's really operating on a third circuit might be like, okay, let's see both sides of it. I can see your side. I can see your side. And like that's, and I, I, I probably operate from here a lot. Um, maybe why I speak quickly, but also why I don't like to me, like a lot of political discussions are ridiculous because I look at basically infants and toddlers fighting over each other, uh, fighting over these ideas. And I'm like, well, uh, they they both make sense. The negative of a second, a third circuit person is that, uh, since they can see both sides of things, they can see every possibility. They don't collapse the wave function. They don't, they don't commit to one reality over the other. A lot of, um, I was saying that, uh, first circuit, survival uh, people tend to be liberal second circuit people tend to be conservative third circuit people tend to be more of like the intellectual liberal of like well let's let's see both sides or like let's let let everyone be but one of the um common criticisms of intellectual liberals uh from the conservative side is that uh, a liberal is a person who disappears once the fighting starts it's not good to always operate from the rational perspective um, and as from an individual level, if you're always in your head, you're not dealing with real problems. This is kind of the rational thing. The rational thing, the, ra the rational person can think about things, but they don't actually engage with things in reality as much. The fourth circuit person, the fourth circuit being the most evolved of these four basic circuits, uh, does its best to empathize with the second circuit's uh, territorial emotions and uh, empathize with the first circuit's survival needs and also engage with the third circuit's rationality, but they do this with morality. They're like, oh, we're like the fourth circuit person's like, we're gonna we're gonna handle all of your needs, guys, but you have to listen to my ideology. My religion takes care of your survival, takes care of your territory, takes care of your need for uh, intellectual understanding, but you have to believe in this God, or you have to follow this way, or you have to pray to this flag, or you have to join my club, or whatever it is. That's what the fourth circuit person does. And um, whereas most of the voting population in most countries are first and second circuit operating, the, intel the intelligentsia tends to be third circuit and the um, actual politicians tend to be fourth circuit uh, and they call the shots. Um, and, and one thing to know about the fourth circuit is not the last circuit. These four circuits are what we all have to some degree. Uh, according to Timothy Leary's eighth circuit model, which we will, the rest of which we'll cover in a later, um, in later episodes. Um, the fifth through eighth circuit have to actively be striven for because they, they're not um, physiologically wired. We have uh, parts of our, I mean, I shouldn't say that our right brain is more of our, uh, has to deal with these higher circuits. Most people, for most people, the right brain is their quiet brain because we don't exercise it. If we're not exercising your creativity, or certain things that could even seem um, spiritual, uh, this part of your brain is probably quiet. Um, but for, for, for people who think that the fourth circuit is the end all be all, just consider the fact that um, if you follow the ideologies of the people in your town or the people in your city or your reference group or your parents, if your parents vote a Democrat and you're a Democrat, if your parents eat in a certain way or your culture eats a certain way and you do this, you're following the social norms of your group, then you're probably running on a, your, your first circuit, your fourth circuit has not been 
emancipated. And when we talk about individuation and the whole purpose of the hero's journey is to break free of the conditioning of whatever your fourth circuit um, environment imprinted onto you, go into the unconscious, go into the collective unconscious, gather what is intentional and empowering for you and come back and create your own reality. That's the point of this. But transcending these four circuits, we will get into at a later time. Um, yeah, but a lot of uh, spiritual practices that deal with the body and thought are dealing with circuits one through three and sometimes four in an attempt to not be controlled by it. But very often, if it becomes a religion or a dogma or an ideology or a nutrition system, it ends up becoming dogmatized, which is why we need to learn how to, or if we want to be the most happy, fulfilled, free versions of ourselves, we want to um, exercise the circuits beyond the fourth circuit. Anyway, that's all for this. This is uh, another two hour episode. Uh, if you are listening to this and enjoyed it, please drop me some sort of interaction on the podcast uh, mainly. Um, I've, I've neglected um, that, but I, I, uh, I'm very grateful for everybody listening to the podcast. Uh, you know, we have a, a bunch of people around the world listening on iTunes and Spotify, and I appreciate your support because uh, obviously without it, I'd just be talking to myself on the internet. Um, and I think all of this stuff is cool. So if you have any questions, comments, the best way to get in touch with me is to join the Mask and Underground forum on Facebook. If you go to forum.maskandunderground.com or search for Mask and Underground on Facebook, you can join the group. It's the easiest way to interact with me. Um, I don't know if it's going to be next week, but I, I am going to be doing the other circuits um, in, the, in Timothy Leary's eight circuit model beyond the first four circuits. Probably won't do all four in an episode because, as you can see, these four circuits took uh, two hours. But I think, um, and I think they might need a little more. Um, we'll see. I'm going to research them and, and see uh, how I want to speak about them. Uh, if you have any questions, reach out to me in the group. Um, what else? We have some great podcasts coming up in case you missed the early announcements. Carol Elliott uh, from Existential Kink, Mark Lewis from The Bi Biology of Desire. John Gray from Men from Mars, Women from Venus, and Montauk Chia from Montauk Chia Books uh, will be on the podcast in the next month. Um, so make sure you're subscribed on wherever you listen to podcasts to catch those. Uh, I think that's it. Enjoy the rest of whatever you're doing.